What does it mean to fall in love with someone? With no personal experience to draw from in the past, I would have said that love is a fluttery feeling. It's the magical moment when a character lays eyes on their soulmate for the first time. It's two teens sitting awkwardly in silence under the moonlight. It's checking the weather report and puncturing a hole in the tire of your family's car to get Shirogane to share his umbrella with you on a rainy day because you're too insecure to just admit your feelings and ask him directly, Are all straight people like this? My perspective was born through the media I consumed and the people I observed in my personal life. But as I gradually came into adulthood, the gap between these established expectations and my actual lived experiences continued to grow. Where I would often see others fall in and out of love frequently, and where many stories would just assume the development of attraction as a given, I was still waiting to be struck by it. And when that did finally happen, it wasn't anything remotely resembling what I had anticipated. It was around this time that I found Bloom into You, and because of it, I took a serious interest in the concept of aromanticism. This idea that I might have simply lacked the ability to perceive romantic attraction entirely seemed closer to the truth than the self-image I had created through past observations. Some of you may have even watched my original video posted right as the anime was wrapping up in which I tried to dig into this topic. It's not perfect, in fact it barely scratches the surface of the matter, but it meant everything to me at the time. I had finally found an answer for why I wasn't falling in love with anyone for why I couldn't relate to romantic media, for why I didn't understand dating or flirting or sex appeal. After years of general confusion and feeling excluded from this all-inclusive club people called romance, I finally figured out why I didn't fit in and why I would always be alone. So why did that make me feel empty? Why then was I still sad? Honestly. もっと if you've seen that past Bloom project, some of what I'm about to say might sound familiar, but for the sake of painting a more complete picture in this piece, I need to revisit that material. In the past, I said that I read Koito Yu as aromantic, and that Maki, her classmate, contrasted her as the theoretical notion of a complete lack of attraction. In a sense, that's correct, but it's a rather black and white way of framing the discussion. While many of Yu's hangups act as effective visualizations for what going through the motions without the spark is like, her mentality is what ultimately distinguishes her from an arrow person. In the opening shot, she reaches for a light she can't grasp, symbolic of the dazzling love portrayed in shoujo manga and song lyrics that she doesn't possess within herself. Directly engaging with this emotion she doesn't feel only reminds her that she's numb to it, her actions exposing a dark, cold, colorless void in her heart. This anxiety arises from the contrast between idealized social expectations and her own reality. She anticipates the fluttery feeling that most seem to experience easily, doesn't get it, then feels obligated to develop the feeling in line with her peers. Her apathy isn't sourced from trauma or anything hostile, it's just part of her personality. Not only is Yu stated to be indecisive several times throughout the story, but she's also considered a very tolerant and stubborn person, so it would be reasonable to assume that her dealings with romance tie into that. When she gets begrudgingly dragged into something, like her middle school baseball team, she commits wholeheartedly to it. So much like how Nanami Toko flips from loving no one to loving the one person who also claims to not experience love, Yu develops an interest in Toko as someone who could potentially draw love out of herself. The fact that she wants to experience the other side of that affection is enough to show that she is capable of it. But there's a disconnect. Where Toko's love is quick, Yu's is a slow burn. She has to work for it, and because she wants to know love, she's all the more determined to see where Toko's flirting leads her. This is where I stand by my original video in saying that Yu's arc works as a strong jumping off point for discussions of aromanticism. Like many things, however, romantic feelings are not a binary, 
and failing to account for this spectrum led me to oversimplify my conclusion. This is what makes Maki's role as Yu's foil so valuable. He is the spectator in a theater, the fan in the stands of a sports game. He doesn't desire affection for or from others, and he's not repulsed by his peers expressing attachment to each other so long as he's not involved. If anything, he admires people who can do what he can't, supporting them from the sidelines without contempt or jealousy. He doesn't mind being out of the loop, and the story doesn't demonize him for this. He isn't treated like a broken person who needs to be fixed. He doesn't get forced into a relationship. He's just a dude. And while his lack of attraction is used as a narrative tool, it's never portrayed as a negative trait. The only time he's ever cast in a potentially harmful light is when he accidentally discovers Yu and Toko's secret, which leads Yu to fear he might out them and damage Toko's reputation. Thankfully though, this never comes to pass, because Maki isn't manipulative. He's a kind friend, someone comfortable with who he is, and without his advice, Yu might not have gotten her happy ending. The scene at the batting cages in chapter 39 is one I come back to a lot. After Yu finally opens up to her emotions and upends her prior dynamic with Toko, she tries to retreat from the pain of what she assumes is rejection. She figures she should just try to enjoy love as a spectator. It's not something for her after all. But in saying what she does, she trivializes Maki's perspective. After striking out, she pretends she can just take a seat in the stands as if she never played. But what does that say of the people in the stands? What does that say of the other players? This scene is part of why I wanted to readdress aromanticism in this video, because when Maki tells Yu that they are not the same, he also seems to say, my way of life is not something you can just escape to. It is not a solution to your problem. Aero people experience their own type of erasure when they're told things like, you just haven't found the right person. You'll fall in love one day. Someone running away from their emotions after a big rejection by simply saying, I can just be the same as you, sounds like an insult to the unique struggles of Aero people. And that's exactly what I feel like I've been doing. Maki is aromantic, that much is obvious. But to say that Yu is just as Aero as Maki is clearly wrong. Core to this mistake in judgment was my own identity, and the fact that I kinda project onto the cast of Bloom into Yu, maybe a little more than kinda. At the time, aromanticism was still fairly new to me, and Yu was a character who faced a similar barrier to love as I did. So if I had believed myself to be Aero, and Yu was the character who led me to that realization, surely she must be Aero as well. But that was merely the first stage of my journey. Thirteen anime episodes had flipped my worldview on its head, but I had yet to properly realign that vision. Now that I understand myself better, I'm able to correct that bias and take the conversation further. Of course, saying that Yu is capable of feeling romantic attraction does not mean she can't still be some shade of Grey Arrow. If I was really committed to labels, I'd say that demi-romantic would be more applicable to what we see of Yu, and some of my commenters would agree. In the beginning, she doesn't reciprocate Toko's feelings, but as Yu warms up to her, feelings begin to bloom. She takes note of Toko's appearance, but it's not the primary detail she invests in. Without first building an emotional bridge between herself and Toko, Yu cannot recognize that affection exists, let alone how she should handle it. That's also how I would describe myself, though I've grown to realize this is one of those cases where having a label for how I feel doesn't really help me understand or convey how I feel. There was a point when knowing of such labels exposed me to new ways of thinking, but now I've had time to process that knowledge. Terms like transgender and asexual cut to the heart of things I can't always explain. But demi-romantic? I guess it's accurate, but personally it doesn't carry much weight. I think it's just easier to say I struggle with making connections, platonic or otherwise. I want to be liked by everyone, but I'm always putting barriers between myself and others. There are some people who I've interacted with for years that I've never become mutuals with. Some mutuals who I should probably consider friends, yet don't. And then there are friends who I still keep at arm's length. I could probably count on one hand the friends I'm willing to open up to. And even then, it depends. I don't know when or where this mentality started, but I've gotten terrified of burning bridges with people. There's a part of me that believes someone's gonna hurt me if I let them get too close, so I prevent most people from getting that chance. It would probably be healthier for me to tone that back a bit, though that'll be easier said than done, 
But I've also come to accept that as part of who I am. I don't really want to be the kind of person who trusts everyone. I want to warm up to new friends organically. I want to be somewhat skeptical of the people I associate with. Even if I recognize that some change will be a good thing, I'm otherwise comfortable with this side of myself. And that's what makes love so confusing to me. I've always lived like this, keeping a comfortable distance. Up until now, I had sworn to myself that I'm content with loneliness, because none of it was ever worth the risk. だから好きを持たない君が世界で一番優しく見えた。ゆうは実際とても優しい人だった。私をどこまでも受け入れてただそばにいてくれる。この in the first video, I made a comment about relating to both you and Toko in confusingly conflicting ways. Which, in hindsight, should have made it pretty obvious that the conversation wasn't over. Let's unpack that sentiment. Nanami Toko is a girl uncertain of who she is and who she wants to become. After the death of her older sister, she dons a mask of perfection, resembling her own idealized image of her late sibling. But in copying that likeness, her own sense of self is obscured. The old Toko was timid, unremarkable, but by performing a character other than herself, she could become special. Toko loved her sister immensely, so much so that she had nothing left for herself but that adoration came from a limited viewpoint. For Toko to be flawless, the siblings she idolized had to be flawless. And if the latter was untrue, the former would be reduced to nothing. What value is there to an empty void? Unlike you, Toko's conception of love is informed by childhood trauma rather than her natural inclinations, which distinguishes her from a similar aromantic reading. For one character, learning to love is the crux of her arc. For the other, Love is a means through which her arc develops. Toko does not respect her own identity, so the prospect of someone else cherishing something she hates makes her uncomfortable. Such a development would challenge her performance and attack that sensitive wound, which is why she falls for you the second it's stated that you is incapable of loving anyone. You is the only exception to Toko's fear. While those who sought Toko out were rejected for even making an attempt, she connects to you through a mutual sense of emotional apathy. And because Yu is the type of person to be led into things, Toko is able to take the initiative. This event being what kickstarts the story puts Toko in an active romantic role from the outset. So from an aromantic lens, she mainly served as the outsider contrasting Yu. That's not to dismiss any and all correlations between mental health and emotional development, of course. As is evidenced by Toko, core personality traits can be altered by the trauma people experience. Romantic attraction is not above that. However, even if her outlook once mirrored the perspective of aromanticism, the existence of others alongside her, such as Yu and Maki, lends weight to her potential place in the discussion. Toko's emotional hang-ups might have been solvable, making her inability to feel attraction nothing more than a passing phase, but that is not the case for someone like Maki. Toko's apathy stemming from abnormal causes does not invalidate the natural demi-romanticism of Yu. Most importantly, these circumstances do not problematize the relationship of Yu and Toko in their own right. So with that said, here's a natural segue to Hunter x Hunter. Much like Gon and Killua, Yu and Toko's relationship can be seen as a precarious one based on miscommunication and greed. But naturally, that's only one side of the coin. Toko telling Yu not to fall in love with her is selfish and bordering on abusive, but Yu lying about not pursuing that possibility is dishonest and distrustful. The negativity goes both ways. Thankfully though, paralleling the boys once again, the two are grounded by a constructive belief in each other. 
even the flawed phase of their relationship was still full of warm, sentimental moments. They avoid falling into toxicity because leaning on each other allowed them to better actualize their own identities. People are complex, so attempting to view anything from a pure light and dark framework is going to miss context. This is particularly interesting through the lens of demiromanticism, because it highlights the struggle people can go through to discover those emotions within themselves. What happens when feelings are one-sided? Accepting someone else's feelings could lead to love, that person could end up wasting time with someone who they're incompatible with, a result which itself could make or break a friendship. Or, nothing could change. Wouldn't that be a fascinating outcome? What happens if someone is willing to tolerate the love of another without reciprocating those feelings? A key flaw with you and Toko's early relationship was a lack of proper communication. But with an open dialogue, two people can just as easily coexist without mutual affection. One might call that a queer platonic relationship. More than friends, less than lovers. Yu's tolerance allowed her to entertain Toko's desires, provided consent was given. Her stubbornness kept her testing the limits of her own desires, something which her love-struck partner clearly was not opposed to. In the hypothetical scenario where Yu doesn't eventually fall in love, however, who's to say the pair couldn't still enjoy each other's presence? Provided Toko's happiness never came at Yu's expense, the two could still elevate each other. Platonic connections can just as easily rival the bonds of mutual love. And on a related note, there are other kinds of love beyond romance, such as that between family. It's a conversation that goes well beyond the scope of a single piece of media. But the conversation has to start somewhere. And for me, Bloom to You was the start. For context, I've never dated anyone, but I have had two crushes before. In both cases, I was basically kinda like you in that it took me a few months of being around the other person to start noticing I was interested, but the two experiences were largely polar opposites. I said nothing the first time, so I didn't even give myself the closure of a rejection, but I did end up distancing myself from that person, so it's not like I was actively trying to cling to unrequited feelings. Without that catharsis though, my inaction haunted me for a while. The lesson I learned from that was to be honest with my emotions, and accept rejection when it happens. So when my second crush turned me down, I assumed that would be my closure. After the initial emotional impact, I was ready to return to being single and indifferent, until that familiar feeling burned within me again. But that's not what happened. It feels weird saying I've had a hard time getting over these crushes, because in neither case were we ever an item. What was there to get over? Better yet, how? Through what means could I move beyond something I had no control over? I didn't actively choose to develop these emotions, they just appeared. And when I made an active effort to leave them behind, they stuck with me. I can only assume that this is where other people might seek out relationships with strangers or acquaintances to fill the void. But the prospect of linking myself to an unknown sounds totally backwards. How can I put my trust in someone who hasn't even had the chance to earn my trust? Dating apps would be functionally useless to me for that reason. And even though there's a degree to which I feel pressured to meet an invisible standard with this stuff, I'm ultimately fine with that. I don't need to do what other people do. I don't need to understand how they can rebound from such strong emotions so quickly. I just want to understand myself. I had already made my second confession when I first watched Bloom Into You, and when I started equating the series to aromanticism, I wondered if maybe what I had experienced wasn't love, but instead some kind of weird, person-specific fixation. The way I slowly developed these emotions and fought even harder to cast them off felt unnatural. It didn't seem to match the romance I'd see portrayed in fiction or hear about from other people. Yu's story reflected that disconnect in a way nothing else had. And yet, at the same time, it wasn't just her story. It was also the story of Nanami Toko. The behavior of this insecure girl who cut herself off from the world hit closer and closer to home as the plot progressed. And at first I wasn't sure what that meant. She was a hopeless romantic, while Yu was more detached. Yet I found myself empathizing with conflicting aspects of their personalities. My belief in pure aromanticism was crumbling, and eventually I found myself circling back to the same problem I faced before, a lack of comprehension. 
This script has gone through multiple drafts, and I've been processing these thoughts since well before I started writing it. But as I try to think of where to take this, I struggle to come up with a clear message. The labels I started with don't seem to fit my mindset anymore. I still don't know what love is. I'm still alone. Was this really just a pointless ramble? Have I learned nothing at all? When I realized I was trans about two years ago, I knew that certain parts of my life would have to change. I knew that I wasn't satisfied with who I was, what I looked like, how I carried myself. I wanted a fresh start, but what I've come to understand is that starting over isn't as simple as being recognized as a girl. I need to put myself in an environment better suited to creativity and mental health. There are personality flaws I want to correct, people I want to hang out with. Throughout high school, I ignored a lot of my problems. As petty as this sounds, me always being forced to cut my hair short as a kid was indicative of how I felt about life as a whole. If I wasn't allowed to look the way I wanted to look, be who I wanted to be, what point was there in caring? Why think about what can't be changed? Well, more recently I have been thinking. In the last few years, I've traveled across the country, met incredible people, exposed myself to new perspectives and ideas. I've made efforts to step outside of my comfort zone, and those endeavors have been largely positive. But because I've started to improve and be true to myself, the flaws that remain sting that much more. There's always something that can trip me up and make me question if I've ever really improved. And it can be tough to separate the constructive thoughts from the destructive ones. For example, is making a YouTube video about this topic a healthy way of getting outside of my own head? On the one hand, it at least means I'm posting a video at a time when I've been struggling to do that, and venting here is at least better than keeping my feelings locked inside. On the other hand, I can't help but feel like my personal musings just pale in comparison to themes I could be unpacking, or heck, even AMVs I could be using to express what words fail to. Bonus points to anyone who noticed the blatant Paramore references. Surely there are alternate avenues I could pursue, creatively or otherwise. It's not that I look down on therapy and proper mental health care, it's just that seeking those out requires a certain amount of energy I can't always access. Which is kind of ironic considering therapy exists to help that. If I can barely motivate myself to drive to the grocery store for food I need to survive, where am I gonna find the energy to pursue therapy? Oh, and what if I need to pay for it? For God's sake, a volume of Shimanami Tasogarai only cost me like 10 bucks. That's all the therapy I need. Let's be honest though, whenever I do find the energy to pursue self-care, I'm investing in HRT first. Why go to therapy over not being on hormones when I could just go on hormones, you know? I feel like I've talked about how stupid the double standard I hold regarding personal content is before, but acknowledging that hasn't done much to make the mindset disappear. Maybe the content side of things isn't the issue. Maybe I'm just that insecure about saying what's on my mind. How can I be sure that my words are reaching anyone? Are they even reaching me? It's not fair. She's allowed to say it, but I'm not. What a selfish, cruel, unfair love. But even so, it's what I wanted for so long. It was dazzling, almost blinding. The truth is, it hurts. I'm sad, I'm lonely. If I didn't understand, I wouldn't have to feel this way. But the fact is, I do want love. だと言っても今のあの子にはプレッシャーにしかならない。今の関係が壊れるくらいなら、このままでいいです。そばにいるために本当の気持ちを隠すのは卑怯でしょうか。I'm not in the stands, but I don't see myself on the field either. Following the baseball metaphor to its natural conclusion, 
I guess that would make me a bench warmer, which actually sounds more accurate than I expected. I'm interested in playing. I have the potential to play, but I'm not actively doing so. As a result, I have this mixed view where I can connect to both sides without fully empathizing with either. The majority of this video has spoken of how I relate to the aromantic position, but as I alluded to earlier, what of the others? What of the third wheel? Well, polyamor? Psyche Sayaka is a queen, and a reminder that love can be messy even when one knows for sure what they're feeling. The beauty of her character is that she did nothing wrong. Though she too saw through Toko's facade, her fondness for the girl gave her pause in challenging the act until it was too late. She put Toko's burdens first and sidelined her own ones to support Toko in the way she thought best. Sayaka was an admirable friend, and her presence had a decidedly positive impact on Toko's life. The tragedy of her character is that she just wasn't the one. By sheer happenstance, you stumbled into the student council and took that spot out from under her. An unfortunate outcome for the queen, but not without a silver lining. Her confession closed the emotional gap between herself and Toko, strengthening their bond and freeing Sayaka from the weight of uncertainty that held her back. One might suggest that she lost to you in the battle for Toko's fancy, but it'd be hard to argue that Sayaka lost anything here. She comes out stronger on the back of this rejection, even getting a girlfriend by the end of the manga. Her arc is an inspiring example that crushes won't always work out for everyone. But no matter how frustrating getting turned down might be, it's still ultimately a step forward, where silence inherently feeds stagnation. Having the courage to take that leap is remarkable, and I don't want to detract from that by abandoning all hope in my own path. Like the rest of the series, the final volume of the Bloom Into You manga ends with an afterword from the author Nakatani Nio. In this, she states, If my work can enrich those who create and become a building block for their creations, that'd be the happiest thing for me. What's created doesn't have to be art, written work, music, or video. It'd be nice if there's even just a drop or fragment of bloom in someone's thoughts, speech, or actions. Her story had a consistent habit of making me cry even early on, but after having put off reading those final few chapters for several months out of an unwillingness to leave the relationship of you and Toko behind, this message hit me almost as hard. It resonates with me as a creative who aspires to one day leave that kind of an impact on others as well. But purely as a reader, to say that there's a fragment of this story present in the way I think would be an understatement. Even if I find them entertaining, whether from a dramatic lens or a comedic lens, I rarely find myself relating to love stories beyond a surface level. Yet Nakatani offered not one, but three captivating characters that personally and uniquely resonated with me. I didn't want their stories to end, because I knew that would involve the cast reaching a point of finality that I currently can't reach. Yeah, technically the Sayaka novels still exist and I haven't read them, so this journey's not quite over, but shut up, I'm making a point. Since I initially came across Bloom through the first anime episode in 2018, I've learned new information about myself and the kind of person I want to be. Yet, at the same time, I'm left just as confused as ever. I know that I'm capable of feeling romantic attraction, but it isn't something that ever came easily or frequently to me. Some days I really do connect with the aromantic perspective. Not just the lack of attraction, but the lack of any desire for attraction also. It would be so much easier to just be friends with people, and making friends is something I still hesitate over. Why would I willingly sever that sense of empathy with the only piece of media that seemed to share my point of view? Will I ever manage to cross that same bridge? Love is an expression of trust. In the context of the story, this quote represents one's ability to continue admiring another person even as they change. For Sayaka, it is an embodiment of her respect and loyalty to Toko, regardless of the mask she wore. For Toko, it gave her the courage to drop the act and have faith in the imperfect truth that you fell for. But that was never my concern. Of course people change. I want to change myself even. For as long as I've given the concept of love serious conscious thought, I have agreed with this mentality, even if I didn't know how to verbalize it. A significant other is someone you trust more than anyone. Someone you support through hardship and embrace through success. Someone who believes in you when you don't believe in yourself. Someone you can be close to physically, mentally, emotionally. Love is an expression of trust. 
and that trust isn't exclusive to romance. You can platonically trust people, you can trust people in varying degrees, and in the case of aromantic people, that trust might simply exist independently of love. As someone who has undoubtedly felt the fluttery flush of affection before, I can't honestly say that I don't desire something mutual. But that's not now, nor has it ever been, my main concern. I'm not going to revoke my trust in someone who turned me down, because at the end of the day, friendship is equally important. Having more people I can have mutual faith in is more valuable than having a single special someone. And if one of those mutuals just so happens to become special on top of that, cool. I can't be certain that I'll find someone who reciprocates my love one day. But one thing I do know right now is that I've made invaluable connections over the years. I've met people at anime conventions, collaborated on various projects, hell, even just chatted in Discord calls with people from all across the world. I'm so grateful to have the friends that I do and I want to do a better job of conveying that. This journey has made me realize that platonic and romantic feelings aren't all that different, and even if there are ways in which I don't fully understand that, I'm learning. The ways in which humans connect is deeply fascinating, so I will continue to seek out love stories and cheer on the romantic endeavors of my friends from the sidelines. And if I happen to get a shot at the plate, I'll swing for the fences. Because I know of an anime girl who was seemingly incapable of falling in love, and things worked out pretty well for her. They'll work out for me too. Bloom Into You is a series I'd love to keep coming back to on the channel as I've done with Hunter x Hunter, because there's so many other ways to approach it beyond the aromantic framework. Creators like Zaria, Isla McTeer, Taserlad, and Under the Scope have already delved into some other areas where Bloom excels, so I'd be remiss not to mention them. This video focused primarily on romance for obvious reasons, but that's not the only reason I made it. I've grappled with various anxieties somewhat publicly since I started this channel, and while I tend to have mixed feelings about those more personal projects, there's a degree to which they have helped me sort myself out. Sure, some of them could have used more revisions, more polish, more time to actually process the perspective I wanted to explain, but the act of creating them made me confront my issues in notable ways. They didn't solve the problems, I wouldn't be talking like this if they had, but looking back, I can tell that I'm not the same person I used to be. Having those breadcrumbs to follow is important, because without them, I'd have no proof that I've grown. My unreliable memory tends to trick me into lumping all of my personal content together under a generic banner, but in reality, those projects are different enough to have value existing. So as I encountered the same mental blocks for why this video shouldn't exist, I was able to consider how I'd handled prior mistakes and use that to convince myself, no, here's why it should exist. Because more so than any of those past projects, thinking of how to address this discussion helped me better understand myself and how I interact with the people around me. As I write and record this, I'm still in the town where I spent the last 22 years growing up. But by the time I edit and publish this, I'll have moved out of state. The fresh start I've been longing for is finally here. But before I can push forward, I need to confront my past and prove to myself that I can be better. No more repressing my emotions. No more putting off challenging topics simply out of a fear to address them. No more stagnation. This script may have been tough to write, but I was capable of doing it. Even if my experiences have yet to reach a definitive endpoint, this video had to exist now and in its current form. That, for me, is the most fitting way to close this chapter of my life. And if one day, I come to new realizations about myself that aren't reflected in this discussion, they'll have been formed by the people, events, media, and other things I've yet to encounter. I am not you, or Toko, or Sayaka. I am me. And while I may not have a fully realized image of my ideal self, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to change. <laughs>